Right, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, this is uh, either the fifth or the sixth uh, Lambay Economics webinar of the year. Um, as I was saying to, to Philip earlier, we, we aim to do three of these a year, um, but obviously there's been so much going on uh, in the in the economy, and obviously particularly the UK economy, uh, that we've ended up doing two or three uh, more of these uh, than we planned, uh, which is uh, which is great. Um, to the, today, I'm delighted to uh, be joined by Philip Shaw. Uh, he is uh, you know, the, the chief, chief economist um, and based in the UK. He's, he's been in Investec now for almost, tw I think, 25 years. Um, and uh, before that, he was a chief economist at Union Discount. Uh, and prior to that, he worked both for the Government Economic Service uh, and Barclays. Uh, frequently quoted uh, in the press and, and a regular commenter, commentator on uh, you know, national TV and business TV. So I'm delighted to be joined by Philip. Just, to, just before I pass over to him, I'll just quickly remind um, of sort of timing to structure. Uh, this should be for sort of round about sort of 50 minutes. Uh, we may go over slightly, but it will certainly won't take you beyond midday. Uh, Philip is going to talk for you know, 20, 25 minutes. And then that leaves kind of the same time again, or maybe slightly longer uh, for questions. We've had some questions uh, ahead of time, uh, but you know, please do use the Q and A, um, you know, on on the the Zoom feature on the Zoom app, um, as as uh, if you, if you think of something as well. So um, on that, I will pass over to uh, Philip. Oh, well, Philip, I think you're on mute. I think it's sound. No, we can't hear you, Philip. Um, can can anyone else hear, or is it just me? So if Phil can hear, um, if you put something in the chat, uh, that would be uh, useful. No, can't hear. So um, I don't know. It was, it was working fine just before the before the webinar. Um, so Phil, if you can hear me, um, maybe if you if you quickly come out and then come back in again, maybe uh, that might work. Apologize that for, for, for that, but hopefully this will, uh, will, will solve it. Right, here comes Philip. Oh, All right. Is that's that better. Best? Yep, fantastic. So uh, on that, I'll pass over. Sorry for that, everyone, for uh, a few, few minute delay. But on that, I'll uh, pass over to Philip. All right. Thanks, John. Sorry about everyone. I'm not quite sure what happened there. I'm Philip Shaw. I'm Chief Economist at Investec. Um, I am just going to share my screen now and go through some slides with you. And there we are. Right, if the technology is working, then hopefully you'll see the title of the presentation, which is sifting through um, the PM's nightmare in tray. 
Um, you know, a couple of months ago, I might have entitled this uh, sifting through the intrades nightmare prime minister, but uh, let's just see um, where the presentation takes us. I'm just going to go through um, some points on the economy, then interest rates and talk about uh, the housing market and politics. And as John said, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A at the end of it. So first of all, I'm going to talk about um, the economy the labor market and inflation. So let, let's just start off with a pretty simple chart on the economy. This uh, chart is a chart of the size of the economy or the level of GDP, if you like, in real terms. Um, you can see um, in 2020, um, the big plunge in economic output, obviously because of the first lockdown and the recovery given the, by that black line in some fits and starts. Um, over the, the past couple of years and um, what you can see there is um, the, the line that says 100 is effectively the level of GDP uh, just before the pandemic hit and latest estimates at the moment actually suggest that the size of the economy is actually a little bit smaller than it was before the pandemic and actually if you say well during the two and a half years um, since March 2020 or so if we had grown at normal rates, which is about one and a half percent per annum, um, we would have um, been about four percent bigger. Now the economy would be four percent larger than um, is the case at the moment. So we, we haven't really recovered fully from the COVID pandemic in terms of the, the size of the economy. The um, point, I guess, which you can see from the latter part of the black line is that we've had some loss of momentum recently. And some of it is due to the extra bank holidays, which effectively cut output every month. But effectively, the, the economy is, is struggling a little bit. We think it's close to recession. We might actually be already in recession, uh, although recession is uh, usually defined as two quarters or two groups of three months of falling output in a row and we suspect that we'll see a rebound in the fourth quarter because of the recovery from the extra bank holiday in q3 so a little bit techy but i think anyway um we will be in a recession by um early next year and it's pretty obvious why that's happening we've got a cost of living crisis um interest rates are being raised and um, the world economic background has been worsening as well um, if you look at tax policy that's actually working in both directions at the moment but uh, you know over the medium term it's, it's clearly got to be restrictive and you know what we're looking at over 2023 in short is um, a whole year of falling output and um, in terms of our actual number on GDP we're looking for a 0.9 percent contraction in in the year as a whole and as I said you know households are finding life difficult because of the cost of living crisis Let's turn to the labour market. Um, I think we, we all know about labour market shortages. The labour market is very tight. If you look at the standard unemployment rate, that currently is at 3.6%. It's just above a 48-year low. Um, I'll explain the chart to you. Um, it measures uh, changes in employment, unemployment, and what we call inactivity compared with the pre-pandemic period. So if you look, for example, at the light blue line, you can see unemployment rises through the first year of the pandemic and then begins to fall. And it's still falling or perhaps leveling out a little bit now. And that's in terms of the, the number of people unemployed. Meanwhile, um, employment fell, of course, during the pandemic. It has been recovering. But as you can see by the position of that black line, um, it's still about 300,000 below where we were um, before the pandemic. And a lot of that is explained by um, a rise in what we call inactivity. So it's people that are neither employed nor unemployed that are resident in the UK of working age. So between 60, 16 to 64. And the, the increase in inactivity has been something like 630,000 since February 2020. And the ONS, this statistical agency, does 
um, drill down as to why people are economically inactive. And the biggest reason is long term sickness. And we gather that means that people have either got long COVID or perhaps more relevantly, because of the log jams in the NHS, they're waiting to see a consultant, waiting for treatments and, and, and can't work um, and, until they, they get some relief from their illnesses or symptoms. And you know, that, that's the biggest factor. That's over 400,000 people. Another reason to explain the increase in inactivity um, is a fairly big rise. I think it's about 200,000 people um, becoming students as well. So this, this is a real problem um, because we have labour shortages. And one of the keys, I think, to um, solving one of our economic problems looking forward is to reduce that inactivity and increase labour supply, at least from the, the, the domestic um, labour force. We think that that probably will happen. Um, one hopes certainly that health issues will be sorted out and, and people who want to work can go back into the labour force. Um, my guess is that there is a certain um, voluntary amount of inactivity where people actually have reassessed their work-life balance post-pandemic and said, actually, I could do with um, more leisure, less work. You know, perhaps as the economic climate becomes more difficult, then those decisions are reassessed again and we see an increase in participation and, and those labour market shortages aren't as active. But, you know, the participation is, is very key, not just to economic growth looking forward, but um, to wages and also the inflation outlook. And it's... And, and, to... and Philip, can, I, can, I, can I ask here on, mm. on your assumptions on, you know, obviously some form of mild recession either now or, or, or next year does that unemployment does, does the does the job market remain tight does unemployment you know stay in the you know between uh, three, three and a half or four or would you expect there to be a sharper increase in in sort of you know the, the unemployment rate yes we we do think in unemployment is going to rise and it's essentially for two reasons it's firstly that um, we're looking at GDP contracting by close to one percent next year and um, it, it's likely that we'll see a certain degree of sh job shedding from various firms and also we suspect that more people will go back into the labour market and you know that will translate itself hopefully into more people going into work but in the short term as well it will push the unemployment numbers up so we think by perhaps early 2024 we'll have unemployment uh, in the the low five percent at the low five percent mark from 3.6 percent now okay i mentioned that it's, it's critical for inflation let me uh now turn to uk inflation and we'll just have a look at why it's so high um Inflation at the moment is um, at 11.1 percent. That's the CPI rate that compares with the Bank of England target of 2 percent. Um, the, the bank rate has been rising or base rate, as people call it as well, uh, is 3 percent up from a low of 0.1 percent uh, during the pandemic. Um, the chart here, I'll explain the chart. Uh, the, the orange line is simply the annual inflation rate from the beginning of 2020. Uh, the right hand part, the, the grey shaded bit, are our forecasts. And the, the line is broken up into five sections of bar, and they represent key parts of the CPI basket. And the height of each of the bars represents the contribution from that basket to the overall inflation rate. And it's pretty clear if you look at the, the brown bar, that's effectively, it's other fuels, it's effectively petrol. Um, petrol prices have contributed towards um, the 12 month inflation rate same with food which is the um light blue bar food price inflation i think is at 16 and a half percent at the moment the the, the real eye catcher there are the if you like the the, the greenish and the gray bars which are gas and electricity prices and um as you all know the um rise in domestic um, utility bills has been determined by the energy um, price cap. Um, the price cap rose by 54% in April. So if you sort of dial back on that chart a little bit, you can see that point where those two sections of bar widen out considerably. That's April this year. Um, left to its own devices, less to market rates, the energy price cap would have risen by 80% in October. And um, the Trust government um, instituted a 
an energy price guarantee, which froze um, the utility price cap at two and a half thousand pounds. So it was still something like a 25% increase, but not an 80% increase, um, which it would have been had it been left unchecked. So I'd add that it's not individual bills that are capped at that level. Um, the cap level represents the average across the country. Um, if we go forward to April 2023, then the cap um, has been reset by uh, Jeremy Hunt in the autumn statement a couple of weeks ago, and that will go up to £3,000. So you can see there that those um, two bits of bar are still considerable and driving the inflation rate, um, both in an upward direction and in a downward direction, which, which is our forecast going forward from, from, from this stage. However, the most important part of that chart is really what's happening in the rest of it. And that is the navy blue section of the chart. And, and that represents all the other sections we haven't discussed. If you like, that's core inflation. And you can see that that's been rising uh, since the beginning of this year. And that's of most concern to the Bank of England, because what that is saying is that inflation has become more broad based and therefore it risks becoming more persistent. Why has core inflation increased? Several reasons. Number one is that uh, firms are managing to pass on their higher energy bills, but you've also got supply chain issues in there, i.e. you know, shortages of parts, et cetera. The scarcity of labor, uh, which is causing at least some firms to pay up for workers. And of course, specifically in the UK, we've had a fall in sterling, uh, which means that imported costs have increased still further. Um, the Bank of England has been raising interest rates to curb demand effectively. Um, it knows that there's not much it can do about inflation in the very short term. A lot of that's determined by the energy price cap and therefore the energy price guarantee. What it's aiming to do is to reduce that navy blue bit of the bar over the medium term. And when you speak to the Bank of England, they will tell you that they regard the labor market as the biggest threat to medium term inflation. Uh, largely because of surging pay. And, you know, I remember the days where we used to get um, inflation in double digits, wage increases uh, were also in double digits, which felt good for workers at the time. But then all that happened is that firms would pass on their higher labor costs in terms of higher prices. And you'd have this wage price spiral, which was a, a notable feature of the UK economy in the 1970s. Um, I've got an interesting chart here which shows you the sheer volatility of UK wholesale gas prices, i.e. from the North Sea. So each of that line represents the cost of buying gas in the futures market at any given point in time. The latest set of gas prices is uh, given by the navy blue line. And you can see that whilst it's well down from the sorts of rates that we're seeing in late August, which is the grey line, that was a point where continental European economies were, were buying lots of natural gas for storage over the winter because the Russians have effectively shut off the, the main pipeline, Nord Stream 1. Um, but we're nowhere near where we were even a year ago. And our energy analysts tell us that long-term energy prices have been 50p a firm. Um, we're now at somewhere around 400. And although gas prices are expected to decline over time, um, the era of that um, level of gas prices is probably over. But that gives you an idea of that sheer scale of volatility of gas prices. And it gives you an idea why inflation has been so difficult to predict this year. Is this purely a UK phenomenon? Absolutely not. Inflation has been rising globally. It's a problem in actually most jurisdictions. And what we've been seeing is monetary policy being tightened almost everywhere. Um, we've had government borrowing costs that have increased as well. Uh, the chart there shows you um, at the top, if you like, UK, Euro, Euro area and United States inflation. Um, US inflation has been been coming down a little bit over the last 
three to four months, but still very high at over 7%. Eurozone inflation may have peaked at just over 10 and actually, if you went back to the previous chart, you'd see that we actually think that the current rate of 11.1% in October in the UK is the peak. And then we will see inflation going down to around three and a half, four percent by the end of next year. But um, apart from economies such as China, where we've also mapped out the inflation rate there on this chart, um, inflation is a problem everywhere or almost everywhere. And clearly, um, we've had a number of economic concerns throughout the globe which are adding to the geopolitics um, which is adding to global uncertainty and if, if i could stop you there Phil, i'll just real quick because someone asked a question on on the chat which i think was relevant it's about the chinese number so how has obviously china obviously in terms of the energy prices obviously that's global how has china managed to keep uh, inflation relatively relatively low yeah it's um, part of it's an energy cost story um, in the sense that uh, China is very tightly controlling all its energy prices, including petrol prices. And if you like it, it's sort of an artificially low inflation rate because of state control by Beijing. OK, thanks for the question. Um, again, just putting things into a global context, um, I mentioned that most central banks globally were raising interest rates. It's not just the UK. Yes, there is a massive tightening bias in monetary policy around the world. Uh, you can see this chart, which um, essentially maps central banks cutting interest rates in brown. Those raising interest rates are in green. Over the pandemic, you could see that there was a big, uh, big bias towards loosening policy, and that's very much switched from last year. And there are not many central banks cutting rates at the moment. Um, Turkey is one of them. Um, China is another one. Um, the Japanese aren't raising rates, but neither are they raising rates. Um, but clearly, you know, the background of higher interest rates is having a, uh, an effect on dampening economic sentiment around the world. And a lot of central banks, um, e.g. in the UK as well, um, have become more aggressive in their interest rate increases to try and demonstrate that they are serious about getting inflation back to target, which in the UK and most places is 2%. So that's what we call a front loading strategy. Let's turn now to um, expectations of UK rates. I, I mentioned um, that the Bank of England or the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England, the MPC, um, has been a bit more aggressive. We, we had a 0.75% a or 75 basis point hike um, in the bank rate to 3% on the 3rd of November. I mean, that's the most aggressive hike that the MPC has ever carried out since it, in, in its 25 year history. Um, this chart here shows market expectations of interest rates at various points in time, uh, along with our own forecast. So our own forecast is the navy blue line um, you can see that we expect the bank rate to go up to 4%. And towards the end of next year, we are expecting rates to begin to come down as inflation becomes under control. And by then, we will have had probably at least six months of recession, which would be expected on its own to um, do its job and get inflation pressures down. Um, the, the other blue lines represent various market expectations. But by market expectations, I mean, um, using the ingrained prices in financial markets. And um, at the moment, um, that's, if you like, the darkest of the green lines. It's marked latest. Markets are pricing in a, a peak in the bank rate of between four and a half to four and three quarters of a percent towards the middle of next year. It's not changed that much from a month ago. If anything, it's come down. It's come up from three months ago. Um, but compared with a year ago, uh, markets were expecting the bank rate to be at 1% or so by the end of next year. And that shows you just how much things have changed. And again, the volatility of financial market expectations. Um, the, the final point I'd make on the chart is that if you went back to the 27th of September, it's about a week after Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget, uh, markets were believing that rates would 
peak above 6% and not really come down at any point next year. So you've had a massive range in market expectations, even when you're looking at a relatively short time frame of, um, the, of, of 2023. Um, just to make a bit of a more of a, a, a technical point, um, the Bank of England um, forecasts the economy and its projections. You might have seen in early November, all the newspaper headlines were saying Bank of England forecasts a two year long recession. Well, actually, technically, it doesn't. The projections the Bank of England puts together and publishes um, are conditioned using market expectations of interest rates. And at that time, markets were looking at a, a peak in rates of 5.25%. Now, the Bank of England doesn't actually believe that. It, it, it's quite open and, and, and public about saying it doesn't think rates will get that high. Um, but it has to condition market uh, it, its forecasts on something. Um, and if you use a more sensible set of market expectations, the economy wasn't, wouldn't be as weak. And, and that's one point I think the Bank of England is, is struggling to get across. Um, the other thing that the bank has done is it's starting unwinding its quantitative easing, or reversing its money printing. And that's something that is, is termed quantitative tightening. Um, it's reducing its bond holdings. That's not its primary instrument to try and get inflation down. It really does rely more heavily on higher interest rates. And, you know, as I've mentioned already, I think we're, we're expecting a, a recession next year if it hasn't started already. And by the end of next year, we expect interest rates to start coming down. And can I put you a bit on the spot here, Philip? So just looking at your expectations or your forecasts, you're basically expecting a what looks like a half a percent rise either in December or January uh, and then two more quarters in the first half of next year. So. Do you think that rise will come in December or do you think they'll wait now until after New Year? Well, we're, we're approaching the next MPC meeting, uh, which is in just under two weeks time. And we, we are expecting another fairly large hike, but one by half a percent by 50 basis points, not by 75. And we, we very much think that 75 basis points was one off. Um, we know that the Bank of England is, is, is worried about the labour market and the labour market you know, has been very tight. Um, arguably now it may be beginning to loosen, which will make the bank relax a bit. The other thing which made the bank move by uh, three quarters of percent was the energy price guarantee, because although that lowers inflation in the short term, what it also does is that it puts a lot more money in people's pockets. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the key strategy to raising rates is to dampen demand down. So if you are raising demand by uh, giving a generous energy price guarantee cap, um, then the Bank of England is offsetting some of the in inflationary implications of that. But looking forward, once the economy is clear that it is weaker, we expect more labour market looseness to be more evident. It may not be the all clear for the bank to stop raising rates, but then we then expect two quarter of point increases, one in February, one in March, and that's when we get to 4%. What does this mean for mortgage rates? Um, okay, um, I'm preaching to the converted here, I'm sure, when I tell you that if you look at the stock of um, the outstanding stock of UK mortgages, 83% of it is on fixed rates. And that's a massive shift from even a decade ago um, when um, it was 28%. You know, when I took my first mortgage out, you, you couldn't get a fixed rate mortgage, it was all floating. Um, what are fixed mortgage rates? priced off? Well, they're priced off, as many of you might know, something called the swap rate, which is, if you like, you can look at it as a, um, an amalgamated expectation of, of, of market expectation of short-term interest rates, um, but long-term borrowing costs, i.e. Um, guilt yields, government borrowing rates, enter into that equation as well. So um, you know, what we've got here is, is a chart of um, mortgage rates as compiled by the Bank of England. They're the dotted lines. You've got two, three, and five-year mortgages there. And we've plotted that against the equivalent swap rates of the same maturity. Um, you can see they, they, they move broadly together. You can see that big spike in swap rates um, 
which coincided with the Kwasi Kwarteng mini budget when he unleashed a, a large amount of stimulus onto the economy. I have to say now that fiscal policy is under control with Jeremy Hunt taking over as chancellor and of course the autumn statement two or three weeks ago. And you know, what we've seen now is those swap rates come down. The observation that we have for mortgage rates is, is only October, whereas the, the market rates are, that, that should be yesterday's market rate. And we uh, mortgage rates have come down since then, as you know, I'm, you, you will know even better than I do. Um, you, you can get a, a, a two year 75% um, LTV uh, mortgage for five and a half percent. But we still think given how fast swap rates have come down, um, there is more room for those fixed term mortgage rates to come off as well. And in particular, if we think that market expectations of bank rate increases are overcooked, almost by implication, we're expecting swap rates to come down as well. So there is plenty of scope, we think, for mortgage rates to come down, not just from the levels we've got here for October, but from, from current levels as well. Um, I'd make the point that it's absolutely feasible for the bank rate or base rates to move in different directions from mortgage rates. And um, you know, fixed term mortgage rates are all about interest rate expectations. And if expectations over the medium term are coming down, as we expect, it's very feasible and indeed we think likely that mortgage rates will come down from now. Quick chart on house prices, um, pretty simple chart. This is the nationwide house price index. It's what we consider to be probably um, technically the, the best of the many house price estimates that we get. Um, pretty simple chart, the um, blue bars represent month to month movements, changes in the index on the previous month and the black or navy blue line is um, the year on year change, i.e. house price inflation. Um, amazingly enough, um, since the pandemic, um, house prices have risen by about 25% or until recently they'd risen by close to 25%. And we've had a couple of months of house price declines, which has forced the annual uh, rate of house price inflation down to about 5%. And, you know, clearly that's the cost of the living pressure and higher interest rates having an effect on the housing market. Um, what you may see quoted in the press are a number of um, city analyst estimates um, relating house prices to mortgage rates and saying, well, mortgage rates have moved up from, say, 1% at the turn of the year to, you know, whatever, 5.5% now. That means housing, the housing market needs to collapse by 35% or whatever uh, to restore the same amount of affordability. Really, the housing market doesn't work like that. And you get different degrees of affordability at different points in time. House prices don't mechanically move uh, in response to mortgage rates. And the, the other point is that you know, what you do tend to get during periods of housing market weakness is a fall in turnover as well. And I realise obviously that's not good news uh, for people such as yourselves, but realistically, we're probably looking at fewer house transactions over the next couple of years as well. But the idea of, a, oh, I've seen 35% house price fall, I really don't think that is going to happen. And on that, Philip, I assume those, those kind of uh, more bearish uh, views uh, on house prices are linked to rates staying higher, mortgage rates staying higher for longer. So if bank rate uh, comes down maybe faster than, than, than the market thinks, as, 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 you, as you think, then actually some of those future house prices you know, may not be 7%, it may be 5%, 4% fall, but you think there's probably likely to be some fall in there. But at, yeah, yeah. at the same time, it, it, a lot will depend on the, the path of, of mortgage rates, I, I assume. Yeah, very much so. And you know how bumpy the path is for the economy as a whole as well. And on, on the sort of scenario we're looking at, look, 2023 doesn't look like it's going to be a great year, either for the housing market or the economy as a whole, but it really shouldn't be a completely disastrous year. And in, I'll, I'll, I'll summarise a couple of key thoughts on that as well at the end. Um, let's look now on politics. Um, yeah, it's been, it's, it's been quite the year, hasn't it? Um, but there, there was a, a big feeling that 
uh, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng were forced out um, a month or two ago uh, because of the market volatility. And, and clearly um, it didn't help. But, you know, you, if you're sceptical or cynical, you could say this is the real reason behind the urgency behind their departure. And that is the opinion polls. And I must say, I have never seen a set of opinion polls like it, um, particularly uh, towards um, when must it have been the mid-October, perhaps. There, um, the Conservatives were over 30% behind Labour in the polls. Um, there was one particular, I think it was a YouGov poll in the Times, put them 39% behind Labour. Never seen that before. Just out of curiosity, we picked up a uniform national swing model and ran the opinion poll findings through it um, to simulate what that would mean in a general election. And it would mean the Conservatives under those predictions would get zero seats. Now, I don't seriously think that would ever happen, but it gives you an idea of the feeling within the parliamentary party on how serious the situation is from their own personal points of view. And um, since Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt have taken over at numbers 10 and 11, there has been a, a recovery in the polls, though the Conservatives are still 22 percent behind. And, you know, if you look at the Labour landslide in 1997, Blair won it over John Major with a lead of 12 and a half percent. Now, albeit with a different set of dynamics happening in Scotland. Uh, we had a by-election in, in Chester last yesterday. And the results overnight are pretty consistent with the sorts of opinion poll readings that we're, we're looking at the moment. So, look, um, it's a tough economic environment. Believe it or not, this is still Rishi Sunak's honeymoon period. Difficult to believe, but his life's not going to be any easier over the next year, year and a half. And, you know, what we're saying to people everywhere is, look, um, we, we all need to prepare for a Labour government and to work out what it's likely to bring about perhaps towards the back end of 2024. So let me just summarise a few points. I hope I haven't taken up too much time. Um, but interest rates still going up. Um, the Bank of England still very concerned about inflation, um, particularly from the labour market. We see the peak at 4%. Um, and as I've shown, interest rates coming down towards the end of next year because inflation prospects should improve. And that background should enable mortgage rates to come down further. Um, yeah. Geopolitics, international factors you know, have obviously been a, a large influence this year and will continue to do so. And we hope particularly um, a resolution in Ukraine, though we, we're not holding out that much hope in the short term. But it does look as if China, despite official denials by Beijing, is moving away from its zero COVID policy, which should reduce the number of lockdowns in industry in China and help supply chains to function properly. Um, as I said, um, the UK will enter a recession. We might be there already, but we think early next year. And when, when I speak to people about we're likely to be in a recession, um, they, they hold their heads up in horror and just say, oh no, it's not a repeat of 2008, 2009, because we just didn't get any recovery for years after that. And you know the, end on a point of optimism, which is the banking system is fine. Um, the severity of the downturn and the lack of upturn um, after the global financial crisis was because banks couldn't supply any credit. That's not the case right now. This is more of a 1970s, 1980s recession where inflation's too high. The authorities are just tightening policy to squeeze inflation. They know what to do when inflation prospects look better. They take their foot off the brake. And as I said, we get cuts in interest rates. Um, we are concerned about the labour market and what happens if participation doesn't recover. And supply chains, yeah, question mark over those. But it does look as if Beijing is, is relaxing its zero COVID policy, which means, you know, in, in principle, that should be somewhat easier next year. So on that point, um, I'll hand back over to John and um, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Fantastic. Th thanks a lot, Philip. That was uh, that was great. Really, really, really. Uh, you know, we covered so much uh, in in, in uh, thirty minutes or so, and, and obviously apologies to everyone for for the late start. But going back to interest rates, and a couple of people made this question, as, as you rightly point out, 
Uh, obviously, most mortgages are on fixed rate terms and increasingly longer term, you know, five year fixes rather than two years. Um, and also, there's a lot of, as been reported as well, most people who are in the house actually don't have a mortgage or a high proportion don't. And obviously, a lot of people aren't uh, homeowners. So, in terms of actually the effectiveness of interest rates, because obviously, you know, it's, it's only a small number of people that are impacted straight away. Uh, and obviously, that, that increases over time as people come to uh, get a remortgage or if they're buying houses. So, that, that was the question how effective there is. Are, are there other things that we will try and do? Uh, around sort of credit market to sort of dampen down supply, sorry, dampen down demand, I should say. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, John. I totally agree that um, the predominance of fixed rate mortgages makes you know what we call the transmission mechanism of interest rates much more difficult to predict, i.e. how changes in interest rates feed through to the economy are, are, are less certain than they used to be. You know, what we do know, uh, you can work out um, how many fixed rate mortgages expire over a particular period and base some very loose estimates around that. Um, another point is that uh, the number of households with a mortgage is now 30% in the UK. It's a lot less. So not only do you get a, probably a more delayed impact through interest rate changes than previously, but also a smaller impact because you've got a smaller proportions of, of, of the mortgages. Uh, of households with a mortgage. Um, it makes it more difficult to predict. Um, it makes it more likely that authorities will overshoot with interest rate increases. I mean, the Bank of England's aware of all of this anyway. I mean, it, it, it's pretty up to the mark on the stuff that it does. Um, but it, it, it does make it more difficult. And as I said, you know, central banks have been front loading interest rate increases. They've been saying, look, we really don't want to go back to the 70s and risk a labour market explosion. If anything, we'll err on the side of being more aggressive with interest rates in the short term. And then if we need to cut rates, we will then cut rates. That's the approach they're taking. But um, even on that approach, we don't think we're going to get much more than one percentage point of rate increases in the UK between now and the peak. And we, we spoke about this before, Philip, in terms of actually how much of this is um, not inflation, but interest rates are global, i.e., what the Fed does has an impact on the Bank of England or what the ECB does or in terms of interest rate movements yeah. here, not necessarily inflation figures. Do, do, is, is there that point where the Bank of England is, uh, whether it's obviously not explicitly saying this, but there's a point where actually we, we, we don't want the pound to sink any further for whatever reason we want to keep it at 120 or one, one high teens. Does that figure into its thinking or actually less, less, less so? Yeah, I think in terms of the interlinking then, yeah, um, what happens in the US is important for the UK. I mean, firstly, because the, the world economy is integrated. And if you take the biggest developed economy, which is the States, if something happens there, then it's likely to be happening, at least in due course, in other economies such as the UK. So there is a large influence in terms of markets from, from what happens in the US. On the currency, the the central bank bank of england doesn't have a a currency target but it, it does take into account movements in the pound in terms of what it's likely to mean for inflation and the pound as we know has been depreciating for some time and the bank factors that in as as we do ourselves in terms of our inflation forecast going forward but the, the important point here is that um movements in the currency i think from the early summer uh, were a big barometer that something was not going well in terms of UK policy making. And specifically there, markets were getting wind of Liz Truss's plans to cut taxes. You know, just a, a, you know, a point where, number one, interest rates are rising, and number two, the public finances are, are looking fragile anyway. And sometimes a falling pound can actually tell you that something is awry and you, you have to take some sort of remedial action. And, and indeed, you know, the pound is over 120, having reached a, an intraday low of 103 in late September. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And then there's a couple of questions, right, really, and I, again, I, I made, we, we got through this without saying Brexit, but in terms of the supply constraints, you know, obviously some of it is clearly COVID. Obviously, there's lots of you know, issues around Northern Ireland with Brexit. But in, in terms of the supply side issues, it, 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 I mean, I know it's quite hard to sort of separate, you know, has has Brexit made a meaningful impact on that or is it predominantly sort of a, 
the, 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 the issues of coming out of lockdowns as, as, and, and then obviously the energy prices that are the issues. Yeah, yeah I, I think you're right. I mean, there's 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 been a lot going on. Um, I don't think Brexit has helped the economy. That That's you know, one point. Um, but it's very difficult to try and identify a specific influence in terms of, say, GDP. Um, when you've had, for example, a, a 25% fall in GDP in, in March 2020 or April 2020 when the pandemic hit. Um, in, there have been some studies which suggest that you know, Brexit has hurt the economy by X percent. I'm, I'm Actually, personally, I'm quite sceptical about that. Um, it, it is much more difficult to move goods across the border, um, EU, UK border now. Whether that has a big macro impact, not convinced by the data, I have to say. Um, I'd be more concerned actually about the service sector on Brexit because we, you know, the um, trade and cooperation agreement doesn't extend to services. Um, and it's pretty clear that the EU is trying to take um, market share from financial services from, from the UK. So yeah, I, it hasn't helped supply of, of labor because a certain number of EU migrants have gone home at least for the time being. Um, has that really damaged the UK economy long term? I don't think the evidence is there yet, but I'm worried about services. Yeah, okay, great. And then um, one other one, which obviously we, we sort of finished on in terms of politics. Um, obviously, Keir Starmer is very different to Jeremy Corbyn. Um, and does, you know, particularly when you sort of look at how tight uh, the fiscal situation is in terms of balancing the books, from an economics perspective, do you think Labour looks any different with the Conservatives? You know, is it is it meaningful from a macro perspective in terms of actually their tax and spend and their, how they'll approach things? Because obviously they, they, they'll they come out with certain policies as, as they did yesterday around VAT and private schools that maybe that that's not a big tax raiser. It might be probably more political than anything else. But you know, can you see any meaningful difference between the two? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I, I think first off, most important point you've raised that Keir Starmer is very different from Jeremy Corbyn. Um, what might Labour do differently? Uh, I think it's going to, you know, uphold the independence of the Bank of England in, in terms of macro policy making. That's very important. It's likely to keep fiscal rules. Um, Rachel Reeves is, you know, pretty steady shadow chancellor. Um, she's what you want from a chancellor. You don't want anyone who's too flamboyant. Um, my guess is you'd probably see some redistribution of income uh, away from the better off, which actually Jeremy Hunt did manage to do as a Conservative Chancellor in the autumn statement as well. Um, would we get a wealth tax? I doubt it. Might we get um, some penalisation or further penalisation of second homeowners, that's possible. Um, the truth is, at the moment, we don't really know. Um, it's something that we are turning quite detailed attention to, uh, listening very closely to what Labour has to say. But, you know, we're, we're not going to know the majority of its proposals until the manifesto, probably. And that's not going to be until just before the election. Fantastic. Well, that was a fantastic sort of session. I said we'd, we'd, we'd sort of try and finish at 11.45 to 11.50 and we're sort of... Uh, uh, bang on that. And I, I think we've covered uh, covered most things and hopefully uh, answered quite a lot of the, the questions. So thank you very much for, for, for joining us, uh, Philip. Um, it's really, really appreciated. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for dialing in uh, and, and, and listening to, uh, to, to the webinar. Thank you very much. Goodbye.